The International Association for Near-Death Studies presents NDE Radio, a weekly exploration of near-death experiences and similar encounters with the other side. Now, here's your host, Lee Whitting. Welcome to NDE Radio, brought to you by IONS, the International Association for Near-Death Studies. I'm your host, Lee Whitting. A few years ago, I had an experience as a hospital chaplain that I found to be quite disturbing. I was in the room with a family, standing by while the husband and father of those in the room was actively dying from a terribly painful form of cancer. He did not want to die and fought at every step of the way, screaming and moaning, while his family in understandable distress looked on and sobbed in sympathy. The man dying was angry, angrier than I'd ever seen a dying man before. He was clearly terrified of dying and angry even with his family for the situation he was in. It was a terrible death, to be sure. As he took his last breath, I suddenly felt an icy chill move into my body. A wave of disgust and nausea hit me, and while I'd been standing waiting for a chance to say a prayer with the family, I realized I had to get out of that room right away. I lurched through the door and stood leaning on the hallway wall outside the room. I knew immediately what had happened. The soul of that angry, frightened man had tried to move into and even take over my body, and I had to fight to keep control. I told his spirit in no uncertain terms that he did not belong in me and that he had to look for and move into the light, that God loved him no matter what, and he had to move on immediately. And then it passed. The icy chill and the nausea dispersed, and I was able to go back into the room and offer some sympathy and care for the family sitting there. Of course, I didn't tell the family what had happened to me during my encounter. They were upset enough as it was. But I've often wondered about the brief struggle I waged with that angry, desperate soul. What if I'd been out of my body at the time, say, during an NDE, and some aggressive soul decided at that moment to move into and seize control of my body? Would I have been able to reclaim my body and the remainder of my life on earth when I wanted to return? Well, to discuss a worst-case scenario of that situation is today's guest, Janice Goff, a spiritual experiencer who's uh, been on NDE Radio several times before. Today we're going to discuss her encounter with a walk-in, a so-called walk-in, who took over the body of a friend and what happened after that. And uh, we'll also talk about how changed behavior following an NDE may indicate more than you'd suspect. Janice, welcome back to NDE Radio. Good morning, Lee. Good to hear your voice. Yes, it's always a pleasure. Boy, that story was a little chilling. Oh, it It, sure was at the time, I'll tell you. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, gosh. Well, you told me me the last time I was out in Arizona that that you had had a friend who – uh, had um, had uh, I guess a, a crisis, health crisis, and after that was an, an entirely different person. And I thought maybe uh, you, you could tell us that story. Yeah, this this gal was awesome. Just one of the lovely people that everybody loved. She loved her family. You know, she was the soccer mom, um, awesome cook. Just everything you would want in a friend. Um, you could tell the husband and wife they're truly in love with each other, just crazy about each other. And she went and had an operation. Um, we knew the week before she was going in, so of course we all, you know, kept her in our thoughts. Um, she was in the hospital probably maybe a week, and the day that she came home, um, he called us, and he said, Janice, can you come over this evening for a little while? I said, sure. You know, I wasn't going to come because it was so soon after her operation, getting home and all that. Yes. Um, but I said, sure. So I went over there, and what I witnessed was, um, well, my mind just went in all kind of directions. This... Um, her, <laughs> she was, to say she was totally different was astounding to me. 
um, my mind, I, I kept thinking, wow, did did the effects of surgery and anesthesia, you know, we know it affects memory. Mm-hmm. Did somehow this create a split personality in the scale? Am I Am I talking to a split personality? Did it create amnesia where she just doesn't remember anything? Because mm. she didn't know me. And she didn't know me at all and really had no idea why I was there. Um, I asked her about her operation, and she didn't have any comprehension of an operation. Okay, so those are all, you know, basic things. And I thought, well, you know, things will settle down in a day or two, and it'll kind of get back to normal. Well... She sat there really bored, fiddling with her fingers in the chair in the corner of the room. Her children, she had two little children that came in and were clamoring and trying to climb on her, and she kept flitting her hands for them to go away. And then the baby started crying in the other room. So he brings the baby in, and he's pacing and holding the baby. And she said, would you make that baby be quiet? And she never called any of the children by their name. And then I I got to thinking, my gosh, something is way, way weird here. Um, I mean, beyond my comprehension, beyond my experience. And I'm like, this is not a split personality. This is not amnesia. What is this? I had no idea. And I kind of stayed just a few more minutes. I visited with him. He walked me out to the car with all the children, and he said he doesn't. she doesn't even know her children. Her mom called. She did not know her mom, and her mom ended up in tears because she told her mom, what, you know, who are you and why are you calling me? Hmm. So over the next week or two, Maybe a couple of weeks, I had visited with him off and on. He was in the Air Force, and uh, he would call me on break. They had um, some other close friends as well, but they were terrified, so they wouldn't come, and they wouldn't talk to him. Mm. Um, and he said, it's not getting any better. She she doesn't, she, she's not even the same person. She's a vegan now. She won't eat any animal products. Um, She won't even cook. She won't touch it. She won't touch eggs. (laughs) You know, on and on and on. And I'm like, Mm. wow, that's kind of extreme. But the other things that we saw were just a total flip-flop from who she had been. The um, He came home from work and all the furniture was out on the street. And he thought she was moving him out um, because they just were struggling to get along. and But no, she had moved all the furniture out and ordered all new stuff and brought it in um, and had somebody set her whole house up. And it was a total different um, decoration, you know, weird, way, way odd stuff mm. that she brought in to decorate her house with. And then, um, I don't know, over the month, these ambitions began to come out, things she wanted to do, um, the traveling, the hang gliding, all sorts of different things began to surface. And she did not accept that she was married during that time. She did accept that she was living in a place that she didn't know anybody, and she was trying to figure out what she was going to do with her life next. Mm. And she didn't care what he did or what he did with the kids or anything. You know, just she was trying to figure a new life out. And over, I mean, I am I am no expert on walk-in. I didn't even know what they were back then. And I was visiting with another friend, and she said, my gosh, Janice, that sounds like a walk-in. And I 
you know, well, what is that? Because uh, I definitely, evidently am not one. I seem to be congruent from in my lifetime with all my experiences are pretty, pretty congruent. And so she began to explain what walk-ins were and some of the effects of walk-ins on life. And she said, most likely they're going to get divorced. She's going to move away. And everybody that the old soul knew is going to disappear. They're just going to leave her. And she's going to leave them. And her life will be different. And his life will be different. And the kids are going to grow up angry. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> and con- and confused because they're not going to understand. Um, so the old soul's life is, was totally thrown into chaos, and she was really solid. Um, it was all about her. She had whatever mission she had in her mind, she was going to arrange her life to support that and complete whatever she came here for. She did not accept the old name either. She chose another name, and that was more comfortable for her. She didn't like the the uh, phonetic flow of the old name, mm. so she chose another name. <laughs> <laughs> and it was like, wow! How do you how do you uh, synchronize? A soul coming into an aged body that's got a lot of history behind them with a soul that doesn't have any history, doesn't have any karmic connections with any of these people, and just kind of gets dropped into a slot in our earth time where everything visual we label and identify, and she doesn't fit any of that. So it, it was way, it was way, way odd. We we didn't get over that very well, and we missed her, and we didn't know this new person, and this new person did not want to know us. So, <laughs> huh. did uh, your friend who knew about walk-ins say where these other souls come from? Are they ghosts? Um, are they recently deceased? You know, what she explained to me, and I had to go back in my memory to to remember all this, she explained that for a walk-in to happen, there's got to be a walk-out. And because you've got a walk-in and a walk-out, you've got an agreement. And those souls made an agreement somewhere in living time. Time is so hard to talk about in that frame. But did it happen before our friend was even born on Earth that she made that agreement? Um, did it happen during surgery and she was having an NDE experience and someone, you know, approached her per se and those two souls made an agreement? Um, we don't know. It's kind of hard to think of a mom, though, leaving her children and making a decision that, yes, your journey and your mission is higher than mine. I'm done. I can be done. My children will be fine. My husband will be fine. And they have their own journey. And, yes, I'll leave you my healthy body so that you can, you know, come in and do whatever it is you're supposed to do. Mm. It's it's hard to talk about that stuff like like that because we don't really know what took place. Um, the confusing part to me was what does it ha- what has to happen for a walk in to ha- you know to happen and to occupy a new body. That um, silver cord idea uh, yes. where we're attached to a silver cord when we time travel and that sort of thing. That's personal. That is, I say personal, it's individual. I have my own, you have your own, blah, blah, blah. So for a walk-in, that silver cord's got to be unattached from the body and then reattached for the new soul. How does that happen? Is that 
is that a surgery sort of thing all in its own? Are there <laughs> are there people on the other side that take care of that sort of thing? Um, the new souls got to integrate mind, body, and spirit with the new body and may not, in this gal's case, have any of the old memories, but yet totally perform functions in the new body. There's a lot of logistics like that, and some of my questions probably are nonsense questions and don't really have any meaning for conversation, but I just think about all of the the bigger picture that has to happen for this to take place, and in the meantime, we just, you know, I see a vision and a memory of my friend who's not, she's gone. She never came back. Yeah. You know, she's not there anymore. And this other person is there. That's kind of hard to, um, <laughs> that's a little bigger than what my <laughs> little mind and, and brain can facilitate. <laughs> but it seems, it, it seems like you're, you're saying that there has to be a willingness on both souls' parts for something like that to happen. I mean, when I felt aggressed upon, I felt like this this guy who had just died wanted to force himself into me and force me out, and um, but I, I well, refused. Well, one of the things that a little bit um, com- complex here is um, how things happen, and we kind of label things according to the action. So she explained to me, because all I knew about another inhabitant in your body was a possession, and she explained to me that there is a difference in a possession and a walk-in. A walk-in and walk-out have an agreement, and a possession is an aggression, and it is aggressively... uh, you know, that soul is aggressively seeking another soul and is doing the same thing in the spirit, per se, or the soul body that they did while they were in the physical body. So I can say he was probably very aggressive and very um, controlling, um, probably most all the time got his way because he might have been very mean. Um, very pushy, what we consider a bully. <laughs> yes. And, or, or a bulldozer. <laughs> <laughs> um, so she, but she explained to me that, that there was a difference and it, it was how it happened is what, is how we make that dividing line for the difference, whether it's a possession or a walk in. And you got to admit, walk-in sounds a little softer than possession. Yes, I, it I, does. I, it does in my mind anyway, it's, which indicates to me that that's a little more um, agreeable. I I can handle that. Mm-hmm. Possession conjures up all the fear, um, you know, fear now, program that I have. It, in a possession can your soul remain in your body while this other soul moves in as well? You know, we knew a gal in South Dakota who actually underwent a um, exorcism. And the family, when we went to visit on this one instance, the, the gal that had been possessed, they had her sitting in the living room by herself and I did not know any of this story. I just said, oh, you know, where's, where is she at? And, you know, can I go say hello to her? You know, she's one of the, the daughters. And mm-hmm. she said, she's in the living room, but no, don't go in there. She's, she's not feeling well today. And I said, oh, okay. So later I find out the rest of the story and I begin to question, um, all of those kind of things at that time because one of the uh, family members there was actually the priest of the church in that little town.
town we lived in. Mm-hmm. And this this was highly unusual for this whole family. Um, none of them had ever um, encountered something like this. And after all of this was over and she came, quote, came back to us as herself, um, I began to look at the big picture and then to to have all these questions, you know, that didn't have a lot of answers, but the way they answered me was to give me instances in her life. So in a quiet time, she would eat, she would carry on the conversation, she wasn't real active, she didn't tend to the cows and the calves like she had before. She was very uh, sedated uh, sort of thing. And she might have been sedated for all I know. They might have given her some drugs. Um, But then when she was, quote, active and activated, she was bouncing, not only bouncing off the walls, but but very dangerous. And they never knew what was going to trip that switch, Mm. what was going to cause her to race to the kitchen and get butcher knives and hold all of them hostage against the walls. Yikes. Um, They they didn't know what was going to trip that switch. And then later calmed down. She had no memory of doing that. And she told them that they were lying to her. You know, that she never did that. That was ridiculous. Why would she do that? So it it appears that, um, oh, and I knew another gal uh, in Mississippi that actually uh, lived with a possession uh, by by agreement. She agreed to allow this possession to happen. And she became, she ended up with some real severe diseases, was bedridden, and the family totally accepted that she lived with this possession. And they even had a, you know, they called him by name. And when she spoke, they knew when he was there because she spoke with his voice. Um, you know, and at other times when the grandchildren were there, she was herself. So I, I'm, I'm saying there's probably room in our body for a lot of things that we don't know. You know, I don't know that we can count the numbers. I know with split personalities, every one of those personalities can even have different blood type, which to me <clears throat> has been documented, but that is the weirdest thing to me. How could that be? They, that makes no I, sense. I have no idea. That um, I remember reading years and years ago about cases like that. That um, There was that one documented gal. Uh, one documented gal that had, I don't know, she was real well documented, 14 personalities or 20 or something. Mm -hmm. Um, And there was a couple of those personalities that actually had different blood types. And they had, I guess, researched her pretty extensively. I don't know. I don't know how that happens. We're powerful Um. beings, evidently. Yes, in some split personalities, you've got uh, uh, one personality will have an allergy that the other personality w- won't. Yeah, so they, yeah. They they can eat some things sometimes and and not at others, and that. Uh, but you know, you the the uh, explanation could be psychological, or it could be uh, a spiritual explanation. But the blood type thing—that's very strange. That was strange, and yeah. the uh, in, in, uh, is it infirmary for the body, the afflictions of the body. You know, those personalities can have all different sorts of things. Yeah. Well, I didn't experience that with the possession. I I did not experience that, so I don't know anything about that. Um, the woman who had the diseases ended up with these horrible diseases. With her possession, she was sick no matter what, whether he was there or wasn't there. She was mm. still bedridden. So I'm not sure, um, you know, about that. 
uh, I do know that our friend that had that was the walk in when she when the walk in uh, before. Before they got divorced, because they did get divorced, it mm. literally could not, neither of them could handle the life set up as it was. <clears throat> she was extremely vibrant. I mean, it was like a brand new baby or a bird being released from a cage that was just, I'm free, I'm free, and can do anything now. I really can fly. And she was vibrant. She was more vibrant than our friend that had been in the body, who who was absolutely wonderful. We loved her. Um, she was the walk in was more vibrant than any anybody I've ever seen. Her skin glowed. She was really really excited about planning her life and doing all these marvelous things. Wow. Did she ever indicate um, that she'd brought memories of a past life with her? No, she never talked about anything like that. And evidently they fought quite a bit while they were trying to adjust. Mm-hmm. Um, and it was out of his grief of missing his wife. You know, his his soulmate mm-hmm. was gone. And his confusion and had no idea where to go to get help. Uh, yeah. In the Air Force, if you start claiming stuff like that, they're going to they're going to boot you out. Yeah. So, you know, it's kind of like, wow, okay, how do you get help like that when you're in a situation that he's in? Because there are people out there that know things and that can help you logically understand things. Mm. But you know, when you're in the service, you've got to be real careful um, claiming mental health like that, mental illness is how they would label that. So, I don't know, you know. But you we, we, you don't think that this was a possession where the other soul was, was you know, the soul of your friend was just so overwhelmed by the energy of the invading soul that it uh, that she never could express herself again? You know, I, I guess there's that possibility, Lee. I... I just took this other gal's experience. I was real young back then, and mm-hmm. I took this other gal's explanation and experience to be uh, pretty uh, pretty comfortable for me to adjust to the way of thinking like that. And I thought, well, that satisfies my inquiring mind um, to you know to a great point. Mm-hmm. At least it makes logical sense out of this whole thing. So. I never did put her in the possession type of category. Yeah. Um, well, you know, some people but, who experience NDEs uh, are told they have to come back. They, they have, you have to go back to your body. Some mm-hmm. are given a choice, and they're told you can stay if you want or you can go back, which indicates that the body could re- uh, still be uh, viable if not for this soul, then for some other soul. So, uh, and there's certainly um, a, a lot of cases where people have come back and and wind up getting divorced because they have changed their values and their outlook on life so much. Not ne- necessarily a different soul, but uh, different values because of the experience they've had. So that's, I don't uh, that think could we be have enough too. documented cases, though, Lee, with the NDEs coming back and saying, you know. Um, I'm not who I was, and there was an exchange made or something, or I just decided I wanted in there and I ticked her out. I don't think we have any documented cases like that. Yeah. What, what we do see, I think, is people who die and come back and maybe tell their India experience, and then they have another India experience, and then they decide maybe not to stay and right. in that case their body just dies yeah they bless uh, their body dies unfortunately we are we are out of time for today so thanks so much for all your, all, all of your thoughts and your experiences on this subject um well, it's always uh, to tell the folks Lee, thank you of course i'll tell the folks out there that if they'd like to listen to this show again 
or any of our past shows, including all the shows that Janice has been on, go to our website at nderadio.org and click on the Past Shows button. For information on IANS, check out their website at iands.org and join us again next Monday, 11 a.m. Eastern, for more NDE Radio. This is Lee Whitting saying thanks for listening.